The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. We have entered a new era of advice with a continuing advisor migration towards smaller and boutique licensees. This new era places a premium on professional development, sustainability, and efficiency. But many smaller practices are finding these goals increasingly out of reach, as it becomes harder to access CBD in a way that is both affordable and makes efficient use of their time. The Ensemble All Licensee Professional Development Day was created to meet this challenge. Born from the thinking of the Ensemble Advisor community, it's a licensee agnostic, one day CPD event, giving you access to 10 hours of CPD accredited content from leading industry experts. This event takes place twice a year and the next ALPD day is scheduled for Friday, the 26th of May, 2023. You can join this event virtually or join us in Sydney for the in-studio experience. To register, head to ensemble.com forward slash ALPD. Hello, uh, welcome back to the podcast, another episode. I'm James Wrigley and today I've got Christine Bow with me. Christine, thank you for joining me. Thanks for giving up part of your day to, to have a chat. Absolute pleasure. Not a problem at all, James. Nice to be here. <laughs> now, Christine, um, you run your own business called People Focused and we've obviously uh-huh. worked together in the, in the past, which we'll get into in, in terms of your like work history and so forth, but People Focused, what... What is it that you do for people that haven't come across you? Because there's probably some people listening that you may have worked with in your business. So what's People Focused? Maybe let's start there. Yeah, sure. Uh, So People Focused is a HR consulting business. And unlike other HR consulting firms, it's primarily focused on financial planning and accounting firms. So um, my background is primarily in that space. In fact, virtually my entire career has been in with uh, accounting firms and financial planning firms. So it was really about what the idea for it came about in terms of you had the Royal Commission and there was so much change that happened in financial planning that I really saw an opportunity to say, I know this, I understand what's happening in the industry, understand professional year and the impact. And so really being able to take those services out to a broader market because a lot of people or a lot of businesses, I should say, in financial planning really don't have a need for a HR person ongoing, but they certainly still have people requirements and and that ability to create a great culture is certainly something that's front of mind for them. So it's about being able to offer them a service that they can tap into as they need it rather than having an ongoing HR person and at the same time ensure that they're getting that expertise and someone who really does truly understand financial planning. Hmm. So so what are some of the things that you're helping businesses with? I assume you you know you work with a range of different businesses as you mentioned accounting yeah. and financial planning but but what are some of the some of the issues or like what are some of the jobs that you're doing? What is it that you're working on with them? Uh it's To be honest, it's really quite varied. So there are certainly um, some organisations that are still in that infancy phase of really just setting up some really good HR practices. Certainly lots of businesses, which is fabulous, are growing at the moment and they're really leveraging some of the opportunities that are coming their way. So they're increasing the number um, of clients they've got and the number of people that they have in the business. So For those organisations, it's about helping them ensure that they've got some really good foundations in place, so the right HR policies, they've got clear position descriptions, they've got um, good contracts, all of that really fundamental stuff. And then for a variety of other organisations, there's anything and everything from creating succession planning frameworks and and how do we actually help people work through the organisation, what's the pathway for them, dealing with um, you know, other, I suppose, grievances and, and issues that do come up and un- unfortunately they're increasingly coming up 
I think in terms of regrettably, I've got two investigations that I'm doing at the moment. And then there's other things like work cover matters that are coming up uh, or just staff actually needing some support in terms of how do I have a good conversation or managers, how do I have a good conversation with a staff member so that you know something that maybe isn't quite right is being tackled really early in the piece. So I do a lot of that work with businesses in terms of you know, helping them to have good review discussions, good um, informal discussions, and really put things on the table so that you've got clarity of expectations. Got it. And and so you're so so prior to starting your own business, where were you before, and what were you doing? I know the answer, but <laughs> that's the <type> of <laughs> but everyone else. Um, so I was thinking about this the other day, actually. We so I came across for everyone else. Um, joined First Financial really in its infancy. I think um, it just actually started the business and, and about six weeks later I moved across from um, WHK or Crow Hallworth at the time to First Financial and that was back in 2014 and I um, then spent what the next eight years working with First Financial and you know that was in various capacities. I had kids, and I set up this business. So, you know, worked anywhere from essentially full time to part time, being one day a week towards the end of that. Hmm. So, you know, pre pre setting up my own business, largely first financial, and then prior to that, it was with some accounting firms. So, as I said, WHK Co Hallworth. I also worked uh, with. RSM Bird Cameron oh, and right. I ran their HR team from Western Australia um, for a period of time because they are a Western Australian based firm and then prior to that I actually did some stuff in the legal space so I was HR manager at the county court and the government solicitor's office before that and then you know anything pre that probably doesn't really rate because that's 20 plus years yeah. already of my career. <laughs> so how long were you in WA for? Uh, three and a half years, actually. So I was, yeah, worked with RSM for that three and a half year period. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. In fabulous place to live, I have to admit, but a bit too far from family. Oh, was it? Yeah. So you've been doing what you're doing for a, for a while. You kind of know what you're, know what you're talking about. I think so. <laughs> so in terms of like, and recruitment, like we've just had to hire someone new, new here. Uh-huh. Um, what's the... What's the general feeling? I guess do you have some exposure? I imagine you do, but but you know, yeah. what's the general feeling out there in other businesses? I know a bit of what's going on within you know the walls of First Financial where I am, but um, general feeling out there in terms of finding good people, retaining good people, like what what's happening out there? Yeah, for sure. Um, look, I think the reality is everyone. You know, there's a level of anxiety when you have to recruit yeah. in the sense of, and it'd be interesting to understand your experience since you've recently done it, but you know, certainly with the clients that I'm working with at the moment, the, the pool of talent is quite small. Uh, I think everyone, you know, once upon a time, I never really got concerned too much because I felt like there was always a really strong pool of talent that you could draw from. And that has regrettably or unfortunately I should say slowly dwindled so that you know getting good candidates now is just hard and you know whether it's me or whether I'm talking to some of the other um, recruiters that I know out in market you know it's hard to find people full stop it is even harder again to find really good quality people and then there's a price that also comes with that yeah. now and I think that price has, has certainly increased. Um, you know, I've been working on a couple of jobs more recently and I think traditionally probably most of the money was at that advisor level and so if you were paying a big fee there was, you know, it was for the advisor and and they were quite costly. There was a period of time where it seemed like a couple of years back, power planners were incredibly expensive and you sort of felt like you were paying and, you know, relative to other roles, that you were paying an increasing um, or very significant fee for, for those services. I think the, the change has been that now it's across the board. You can't even get a client service individual um, 
at you know anything less than I would say seventy five thousand, and I would say if you can find someone who's got any experience for seventy five thousand at a CSM level, you're doing incredibly well. You know you're probably looking more at something like that eighty five ish kind of mark for a pack a good good CSM nowadays, including super. You know even upwards of that in some instances. So I think the the sentiment is it's hard to find talent. Um, it's hard to and and when you do find talent, it's expensive. Yeah. So I think that yeah, that game has changed quite significantly in terms of you know employers don't necessarily hold all the cards anymore if that makes sense and, and do you have any sense like you're in Melbourne uh, yeah. as am I but do you have any sense if that's any different anywhere else around the country like if these you know the salaries that for various levels in you know, a client services associate whatever it might be if they're any different anywhere else or is it all seemingly expensive I would suggest it's seemingly expensive yeah. to be honest if you're in it a capital city, the the salaries don't tend; they vary a little bit, yeah. but by and large, they don't vary that significantly. Um, and you know, the issue is exactly the same. At the end of the day, the businesses that have really good reputations culturally are the ones that find it the easiest to recruit. And if you don't have that reputation in market, then you know. You're you're probably going to find it challenging to some degree. I've got a couple of businesses that I work with, and one in particular, we had to recruit three client service in. When when I got told that, I was like, "Are you serious? It's going to be hard enough to find one, let alone three. But this business's reputation in market was just so strong. We actually did find three. Yeah, right. And we didn't compromise on the quality either to get three of them. We didn't pay overs and we didn't pay unders for that those individuals either. Um, we were quite reasonable but appropriate for the salary in the market that they were in. But yeah, again, I think to come back to your original question, I don't think it's much different in other states. Um, I think across the country it's hard. I do think if you've got a good reputation as a good, you know, supporter of staff that obviously serves you well but it's by and large it's just hard yeah and, and so it, it, it starts obviously well published that there's there's a whole lot less financial advisors uh, in in australia than what there once was uh, education standards you know advisor exam and all the rest of it there's a whole range of reasons why that that's well published but do you think it, it's so hard to get people at other levels within a financial planning business as well do you think there's just less people around in general like, I haven't gone looking for it, but is there anything published on, uh, like, are there less client service people? Are there less people coming out of university going into financial planning? Do you have any idea about that? Well, I, I think, I mean, part of the challenge is that to go into financial planning nowadays, there are only literally, you know, a half a dozen places that you can go to to get a financial planning qualification without going and doing a grad dip. Um, you know, in some states, there's actually not even a clear university that's offering the, the, the course, so to speak. So if you think about Melbourne, for example, there's essentially three universities that are providing a course. Who are they? In relation, so Swinburne, Deakin and um, RMIT yep. also all have financial planning courses that are approved courses. Um, other than that... If you do something else, you you're looking at getting you know go do the grad dip yep. um, through a provider, or you could get another qualification and then go do the grad dip, etc. So I think that in itself obviously reduces it. I think that there's just to go back to your question though, there's a perception that how do I put it, expectation that you're sort of going to go down that pathway of advisory. I think what we're seeing is a lot fewer. Um, people that are coming particularly into those support roles just for the sake of being in a support position. You know, everyone has this aspiration to ultimately go into advice and somewhere in there it seems as though you know, once upon a time there were lots of people that you just pick up and they've got nothing but pure admin experience and that's okay and we'll put them in and they'll stay there for an incredibly long time and it seems like that group of people has 
dissipated in terms of there's just this perception that unless you're going to become an advisor, you really don't go into that space yeah, quite right. as easily anymore. Yeah, because um, yeah, we used to, you now if I think back from years ago, you know, the XWHK, so there's various people that are, various people rather that have been part of the business that as long as I've known them have been in client services type roles or associate advisor type roles and, and you, you try your best to support them to be the best that they can in that particular role because they didn't want to become an advisor and that's yep. fine. But yeah, maybe there is just less of those people around that yeah. people are getting into financial advice because they want to be a financial advisor, not because they want to work in power planning full time or they want to work in some other you know, facet of the industry full time. Yeah. And I think we've just got to get better at um, you know, publicizing. I'm not sure that everyone, you know, potentially lots of the of the listeners um, always set out to be financial advisors, but you know, maybe not everyone um, even appreciates that that's an opportunity that they can pursue. And and when you think about regrettably, or unfortunately, I should say, you know, the publicity that financial advice has had in the last couple of years, it, it that potentially may have tainted some people's perception of, do I actually want to go down that avenue? So, you know, I think that there's an opportunity at an industry level to help sort of build that up. But I do, and I think you need to, that needs to potentially be tackled, you know, everything from high school onwards so that you're getting more people considering the idea of going into that industry or whether it's, you know, as a financial advisor or even as a support person, um, you know, there's, there's that opportunity to really rebuild the the reputation, but also just help people understand what financial planning is and the opportunities that exist in it. Because the reality is, you know, if there's some amazing opportunities there, there's certainly no shortage of work for anyone interested cool. um, with with skill and capability. Yeah, yeah. And so the the, the professional year that's I don't know how long how long do you, you might know off the top of your head how long are we into having this thing called the professional year? You know, we've got some people here at First Financial yeah. that are you know, just coming out the other end of that, and I suspect they probably started it right in right in the beginning, but. Do you have any idea how long we're into the professional year? Actually into it a good couple of years we now. Are. So, yeah, we are. <laughs> it's 2023. And, um, you know, it actually started uh, quite a while back. Like people could start back in 2019, believe it or not. Yeah, right. Um, I actually gave a presentation in FBA conference on this um, back in 2019 pre-COVID. The, the challenge is that in that first 18 months, I think there was something across the country, like 30 people, don't quote me on that figure, but it was quite low, um, very low numbers of people participating in the PY year in that first year or two. Everyone, and and understandably, was very much focused around the idea of just getting their existing advisors authorised in the sense of getting them through the exams and doing the extra units so that they could retain their AR status. So I think you know, there was quite a lot of emphasis and focus in that space versus, you know, PY's tomorrow's problem. So it's been there for a little bit. Um, the reality is now we're, we're hitting, you know, those numbers of um, very significantly increased in terms of virtually every firm I talk to and work with has at least one person undertaking professional year. Um, and I think, you know, we're starting to see certainly some of my clients there's some interesting ramifications coming with PY in the sense of expectations and and clarifying expectations. I think, Adam, in you what can sense of, of of expectations of this person that's done the provincial year at the end? Like, what's expected of them yeah. at the end, or versus yeah. or what's expected of them going through the? I think it's more that piece around um, and the conversations I'm having at least is is around people going through PY and then because they are qualified as an advisor now, expecting that they'll be given this lovely little book of clients and they can become a fully fledged, because they are a fully fledged advisor on paper, mm. that, you know, now that they 
they can practice as an advisor. So they will be given the opportunity to practice in its entirety. And so it's a really interesting set of discussions that I'm having at the moment because in some situations that's completely viable. In other situations, you know, you've got people that have done a university degree and then they've joined a business and the business has put them through their PY, but they're still only, you know, 24, 25 do you give a 24, 25-year-old a whole book of clients? A, do you have capacity to give that to them? And are they going to be able to really support that book of clients in the sense of do they you know, have the skills to have the difficult conversations? Not so much the, the technical ability, but that ability to you know, foster rapport and a trusted relationship and potentially be able to have, you know, challenging conversations um, with a client. I think that's, there's some of the challenges that I'm working through with some of my clients because you've got this group of people that are qualified, but that doesn't automatically make them a great advisor. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah, yeah, I understand exactly. I don't know if you're, because I know First Financial has been putting some people through PY year if, if that's a shared yeah. experience no, from it, your perspective. It is. It, abs- it absolutely is because we've got this, and again, don't quote me on the numbers, you know, maybe six people or seven might even be more that are at various stages of going through a professional year. Like there's you know, one or two of them that will finish any day now and, and Julian, who works directly alongside me, started his uh, back at the beginning of Feb. So we've got some right at the very start, some right at the very end, and 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 some partway through. But yeah, it's a, it's a, you know we're we're trying to deal with that internally now to say, okay, you know, well, now you fast forward twelve or eighteen months, there's half a dozen people that are that are qualified to be financial advisors. Do do we have a need for half a dozen financial advisors? It's it's no, you know, we you know, you, if you. If you go down this route of trying to hand over clients to to these to these new advisors, you know there's not not enough of them to go around. So we're actually working uh, with other things. So you know everyone's having to what we're doing internally here is whoever that that person that's going through the professional year works directly with, they're having to come up with business plans to say, okay, well, James and Julian who works directly with me, it's like, well, what about what are our plans for Julian when he finishes? Is he actually going to be a fully fledged advisor? Is he going to be half associate, half advisor? What support are we trying to to provide to them in terms of you know, giving them clients maybe to to start off and to continue to practice and to and to learn and to grow? Versus what support are we then uh, offering to them so that they can kind of go out and build their own networks and try and find their own clients? Yeah. So, so I ran a session internally with the people in my team a few weeks back on. This kind of one of the opening questions that we said to them, look, who actually knows you exist? It's great, you know, you're a fun, you're an advisor here, but but for someone to want to come and sit in front of you and speak to you and 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 become a client of of you know you and the firm that you work for, they have to know you exist in the first place. So write down on the piece of paper who knows you exist, and then how do we find more people that that will know you exist? So, yeah, can appreciate the challenge that that everyone's going through. I think that's a great question because I think, interestingly, that's probably always been one of the challenges, the businesses that I work with. There's no shortage of people who want to be advisors um, and you know, there's certainly no sh- challenge, uh, shortage of, of clients for a lot of businesses. So being able to hand over clients that new advisors can take on, to some extent, you, know, you can do that. Helping those individuals also become great business development advisors and and being able to generate their own leads and and really, you know, foster their own networks is probably been a challenge for virtually every single business I've worked with since I even started this organised, you know, my consulting firm and pre that, it's probably one of the biggest challenges most organisations have said, you know, how do you help individuals to become great, you know, business development right so that they're generating as well as servicing and help you know, PY you doesn't necessarily do that it just helps you to be able to see your strategy from beginning to end so to speak so um, helping them and giving them some project work that's going to allow them to do that I think is a great way to support their continued development whilst making sure that they 
feel like they're growing because that's, I think, part of the, the challenge, isn't it, always? You know, I always say to my clients, HR ultimately and, and people management ultimately is about two things, showing the staff that you work with, that you care about them and being able to support their growth and development. And I genuinely believe that for the most part, not every scenario, but for the most part, if a manager can do that, if a business leader can show that they care and create that pathway that supports development and growth, you know, people will stay with you. you know, and this is where you know, money is important, absolutely. But at the same time, that's usually not the differentiator. You know, people will stay with someone that feels has their back, um, even if they're not paid as much as they could get in market. If they feel like someone that they're working with cares about them and is supportive of their development, generally they stay. People will run really quickly from a high salary if they don't feel they're getting those things. Yeah, that's what I was going to. I was going to ask you next. Like you, you mentioned before about the kind of the cultural reputation. You know, you're talking about a, a client that you're working with, and you manage to find three client service managers. What is it that the good businesses are doing around culture and their reputation in market? Like I sit here and say, how how, how does First Financial have a reputation out in the market? It, now, I assume we do, but how does that even come about? And what are the what are the good businesses doing to 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 foster that? So, which I imagine retains good, you know, not only retains good people, but you can attract good people. Is there anything, you know, any experience, anything you can share in that? Yeah, you know, and and we all talk about the fact that culture is really hard to define in terms of, you know, it's what's unsaid as much as it is what is said in an organisation. I think, you know, you certainly have a brand and I know, I remember when I first spoke to businesses about some of these, you know, online forums and chat rooms that former employees, you know, post on and and I remember, you know, some businesses being absolutely surprised that they existed but really challenging the idea that, well, that's just where disgruntled employees go to. That might be the case but that is part of what's building your reputation and brand in market in terms of Quite literally, you know, I know my little sister, for example, is 10 years younger than myself. I remember when she went for a job a couple of years back, the first thing she did was to get onto one of those forums and see what the ratings were for this organisation and what other people were saying about it. What are, the, what so are those forums? Is it, is it like Reddit or something? Um, or like whatever? Whirlpool. Yeah, oh, Whirlpool, like Whirlpool yeah, yeah. Yeah. and those sorts of things. You know, you get onto them and they will they might be disgruntled, but there'll also be typically some really positive feedback. And if, yeah. you, you know, there's lots of just disgruntled feedback, that does impact. Equally, people know one another. You know, you and I both know, you know financial planning is a relatively small world. True. Um, so people do talk to one another. So that's, I suppose, what starts to build your brand. Um, in terms of what you know, what cultivates great culture, the reality is it's leadership, and it's that leadership at the top. You know, all the the businesses that I would suggest are incredibly strong. It's because their managers care, but it's because the leadership cares, and the leadership models the right behaviour. You know, this particular organisation, for example, the. MD, now it, this is not going to be feasible in every organisation, this MD had about 25 staff. He made a point of essentially every two months he would have breakfast or lunch or a coffee with every employee in that business. So, you know, two, three times a week he was actually doing something with a staff member yep. and they had half an hour to 45 minutes of his undivided attention just to either shoot the breeze or talk about whatever problem they had. Now, that's not going to be viable in every organisation, but it's that care factor. It's that ability to say, you know, it's, it's changing from saying this is an economic exchange where I pay you to do a job for me to actually making it an emotional exchange where it's about I actually, you know, yes, I do pay you, but I'm interested in understanding if what you're doing engages you and if it's not, how do I support you? You know, 
what do you want in terms of how do you develop, how do you grow, how do we leverage strengths in this business rather than just say, here's a widget, now you have to move it from here to here to here and I'm paying you to do it so, you know, stop challenging. <laughs> Which hysterically, historically, sorry, is is possibly what we did do, you know. I pay you to do a job, Christine, just do it. That's You're not going to get the greatest staff these days if that's your mentality. Mm. You know, you don't have to give them everything they want, but you absolutely have to listen and you have to you know, look to find ways that you can take on board some of what they're saying and engage them. Is, it, is there anything we can learn from businesses that maybe haven't done it so well? And so you've just given a great example of, of a business that is. Yeah. But is there anything that we can learn from the scene? You look back and say that. Probably wasn't a great way to handle it. I don't know, handle a situation or something. I don't know. Is there yeah. anything from the bad side that we can learn from? Look, I think, yeah, and and I'm I will acknowledge I'm I'm the HR person, so I'm going to look at everything from a quite a critical lens. You know, if you don't do it well, it can it can be a bad outcome in the sense of we well, just lose that person, um, right through to a terrible outcome of they actually, you know sue you essentially now I've got one matter at the moment and I got involved in it quite late um, in fact it had already you know started and, and so I was engaged because someone had initially lodged a work cover claim for stress and so that's when they've called me in the reality is um, you know that went through a process it's now in a it's we're into year three of a process around a work cover claim, the person is essentially now seeking permanent disability. Um, so they've, you know, had time off, they've got all of this cash, and now they're seeking something in, and it's, you know, gone to lawyers, or it's currently in front of lawyers. It is so time consuming, so stressful for the relevant parties. It is absolutely taking them away from their day job. So, you know, I think, and, and even at the moment, I'm doing two investigations. I, I think the reality is if it goes wrong, you can't end, underestimate the impact of your or lack of care. And if it goes wrong, it can go terribly wrong, mm. unfortunately. So, yeah. And it's there's increasing, I know I've said this to you before, you know, there's, a, for fair reason, increasing number of avenues available to staff. You know, you've got new sex um, legislation in terms of respect at work laws that have just come into play. You know, there's a positive duty that now is imposed on employers and, and it's not just about reacting when a claim gets made, but it's being able to clearly demonstrate that from the outset, you're doing absolutely everything you can to ensure the mental and physical well-being of your staff. Um, so yeah, there's this increasing responsibility and there's an it's $76.20 or something to that effect to lodge a claim if you want to, you know, challenge your employer. So it's not expensive. Um, if, you know, if you go down a general protections um, avenue, the onus of proof is on the business. It's not on the individual. I just have to make the claim, and um, you know, and you have to demonstrate that what I'm saying is wrong. So, you know, to your point, if you're not creating a good culture, if you're not being supportive and caring, someone may challenge you on that, and it can have incredible repercussions on your business, not just in terms of losing good staff, but also, you know, what does that do to the perception of everyone else in the business, to the, your brand in market, let alone financially, time-wise, stress-wise on all of those senior leaders. And I have seen it happen on multiple occasions. That's scary. <laughs> That's really scary. I don't know what to say to follow up that. It's what? like, oh, God. <laughs> I don't know. I'm really not that dismal. No, I know. No, we should. We should have had the. We should have finished on the brighter note rather than the 
rather than the sour note. It's well, the, the positive is that that's that's not um, every business. In fact, the reality yeah. is, you know, most businesses are not in that. But I think, you know, I was more taking in terms of you need to care because the 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 ramifications can be be significant. I think the reality is most businesses understand that people are incredibly important. I mean, that's what financial planning is. They're people businesses. Yeah. So getting great talent um, is is really critical. And there's absolutely some great talent coming through in organisations and some great opportunities for businesses. So that's, the, you know, there's real positives there. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, we might uh, we might wrap it up there. Thank thank you for your input. But for anyone that wants to uh, catch up with you, reach out to you. Where can people find you if they if they want uh, to pick your brain yeah, sure. on something? Where can people find you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So LinkedIn's probably one of the easiest and um, best options because that's got all my details. So you know, Christine Bow. Um, but LinkedIn is is certainly the best way to be able to do that. Or you can always email me at Christine at peoplefocus.com.au. Yep. We'll put some, some of those details in the show notes or Kieran, who does the production, will for me. Um, thanks, Christine. Good to catch up with you. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, good. Take care. Thanks, Christine.